Anarchy and confusion long prevailed in Sparta, Plutarch writes. In the days before Lycurgus, it was a period marked by unrest, tension between the kings and the people. And it was in the middle of one of these resulting riots that Lycurgus' own father, the king of Sparta, was killed. And when the older son, Lycurgus' older brother, succeeded to the throne, he himself died shortly thereafter. And so, Plutarch writes, the right of succession rested in Lycurgus, and reign he did until it was found that the queen was with child, and the son she would bear was his nephew Charileus, who would become the next king. His reign had lasted only eight months, but he was regent to his newborn nephew, Charileus, and Plutarch tells us that his esteem among the Spartans grew. He was honored by the citizens, and there were more who obeyed him because of his eminent virtues than because he was regent. Some, however, Plutarch continues, envied and sought to impede his growing influence. It is because of this that Lycurgus thought it his wisest course to avoid their envy by a voluntary exile and to travel from place to place until his nephew came to marriageable years. And so the story goes that he traveled around the Mediterranean nations to learn about the various forms of government. He went to Crete, where he found a sober people whose laws he liked. Then he went to Ionia in Asia, where he found an extravagant people whom he did not like as much, and it's possible he went to Egypt as well, and that it was there he got the idea to create a permanent standing army. Lycurgus brought back all of his ideas to Sparta, where he found a people still at odds with the kings. He formed a plan for his complete reformation of the government. He shared his plans with some people privately until he had formed a faction ready to openly advance his cause. Plutarch writes, when things were ripe for action, he gave orders to 30 of the principal men of Sparta to be ready armed at the marketplace by break of day, to the end that he might strike a terror into the opposite party. Now it is hard to picture how this transfer of authority was actually made to Lycurgus. We see armed men, their purpose to strike terror into the opposite party, and one of Sparta's two kings joins his side. But the next paragraph in this biography shows Lycurgus acting upon his initiatives with no further discourse from Plutarch as to over what political opposition he had prevailed or by what means that opposition had been defeated. In his life of Solon, the Athenian, Plutarch writes that Lycurgus achieved his ends by applying more force than persuasion. But there is no doubt that Plutarch uses glowing language to describe the Spartan state. So let's begin this next section. Amongst the many changes and alterations which Lycurgus made, the first and of greatest importance was the establishment of the Senate, which having a power equal to the kings in matters of great consequence, and as Plato expresses it, allaying and qualifying the fiery genius of the royal office, gave steadiness and safety to the commonwealth. For the state, which before had no firm basis to stand upon, but leaned one while towards an absolute monarchy, when the kings had the upper hand, and another while towards pure democracy when the people had the better, found in this establishment of the Senate a central weight like ballast in a ship. So to read about the value of the Senate in the context of its real function is a reminder. A Senate does not only act as a check against the absolute rule of one over all, but it is also a check on us, the people. In fact, we must take this to mean, which is Plutarch's words, that the Senate is every bit as much a check on the people as it is on absolute rule. What other interpretation can there be when we see it referred to as a central weight with no preference given or indication made that its task is to weigh more heavily the will of the people, like it's a superseding edge over the monarch? No. No, those words we see are fiery genius. The Senate is to qualify the fiery genius of the royal office. So the Senate's dual purpose includes the preservation of the monarch. Now the Spartans did not have a constitution. They had a retra, which is an oracle that was purportedly dictated to Lycurgus himself by Apollo. This is from the uh, Bernadotte Perrin translation of the life of Lycurgus. Apollo, the Pythian god, was the source and author of the polity. So here's the retro, back to the Dryden translation. You shall establish a council of 30 elders, the leaders included, I think that means the two kings, and shall from time to time, a palatzin, 
or assemble, the people betwixt Babaca and Senation, there propound and put to the vote, the commons have the final voice and decision. So what is meant by the commons have the final voice is that the Senate's task was to present to the people an agenda for them to either approve of or reject. It was forbidden for a person to have their own idea to propose to the government. Plutarch writes, The people being thus assembled in the open air, it was not allowed to any one of their order to give his advice, but only either to ratify or reject what should be propounded to them by the king or senate. Now as to the election of the officials themselves, the method was for the candidates to appear on a stage before the people and whoever won the loudest shouts won the election. Presumably this majority shout is also how the people voted on the referenda that were put to them to be rejected or ratified. There is no mention, incidentally, as to how the candidates were put forward in the first place. And we should probably not assume that the people themselves had a say in which candidates they might vote for. So it is relevant to point out that only soldiers were Spartan citizens. Every other trade was servile and without rights. Plutarch writes, Lycurgus was rigid and aristocratical, banishing all the base and mechanical arts to the company of servants and strangers, and allowing the true citizens, that's the soldiers, no implements but the spear and shield, and no other knowledge or study but that of obedience to their commanding officers. Noting the words, no other knowledge or study, John Milton was prompted to say this in his Areopagitica in 1644 about Spartans. It is to be wondered how museless and unbookish they were, minding not but the feats of war. There needed no licensing of books among them, for they disliked all, and took a slight occasion to chase Archilochus out of the city, perhaps for composing in a higher strain than their own soldierly ballads and roundels could reach to. That's Milton not thinking too highly of the Spartan intellect. And when we further consider that Lycurgus forbade that any Spartan law be written down, if we're thinking like Milton, we might wonder if that was because too many of them were illiterate. Such was the heavy focus on military prowess and such was knowledge or study being limited to imparting obedience. The next thing that Lycurgus did was redistribute the land. Plutarch writes, His next task, and indeed the most hazardous he ever undertook, was the making a new division of their lands. For there was an extreme inequality amongst them, and their state was overloaded with a multitude of indigent and necessitous persons, while its whole wealth had centered upon a very few. To the end, therefore, that he might expel from the state arrogance and envy, luxury and crime, and those yet more inveterate diseases of want and superfluity, he obtained of them to renounce their properties and to consent to a new division of the land, and that they should live altogether on an equal footing, merit to be their only road to eminence, and the disgrace of evil and credit of worthy acts, their one measure of difference between man and man. So he divided the country of Laconia into 30,000 equal shares, and the part attached to the city of Sparta into 9,000. But let us keep something in mind when we read this, that they did not themselves till this land. The Spartans made slaves of the Helots, Plutarch writes, and the Helots tilled their ground for them and paid them yearly in kind the appointed quantity without any trouble of theirs. If you were not a soldier, you were not awarded one of these parcels. You were someone who attended the land. And if you were a merchant, there was no reason to even do business in Sparta, because Lycurgus replaced their currency with an iron coin that was of no value anywhere else in Greece and was the subject of fun. Imports from the rest of the civilized world did not reach Sparta, neither did foreign ideas. You could not come and you could not leave. Plutarch writes, he forbade them to travel abroad and go about acquainting themselves with foreign rules of morality. And also, he banished all strangers who would not give a very good reason for coming thither, lest they should introduce something contrary to good manners. Regarding their marriages, Plutarch writes, the husband carried off his bride by a sort of force. And he goes on to say, she, and this must be some kind of nurse or some sort of matron, she who superintended the wedding comes and clips the hair of the bride close round her head dresses her up in man's clothes, 
and leaves her upon a mattress in the dark. Afterward comes the bridegroom, entering privately into the room where the bride lies, unties her virgin zone, and takes her to himself. And after staying some time together, he returns composedly to his own apartment to sleep, as usual, with the other young men. So they only had sex in the dark, to the extent that, and this is Plutarch still, they sometimes had children by their wives before ever they saw their faces by daylight. And so added to this was, it was honorable for men to give the use of their wives to those whom they should think fit, that so they might have children by them. So you cannot lease your wife out to a man you think would be better for her to breed with. This policy of sanctioned adultery is not one that Plutarch has a lot of praise for. He writes, the Lacedaemonian system is one of an extreme and entire unconcern about their wives and would cause most people endless disquiet and annoyance with pangs and jealousies. He goes on to quote what Euripides said about Spartan women. These with the young men from the house go out with thighs that show and robes that fly about. So Plutarch cites this as evidence that the Spartans became unchaste, that their women became unchaste, flaunting perhaps that their marriage is without limits. But we read earlier that the groom had returned to sleep with the other young men. We must now add that Lycurgus made an ordinance that they should all eat in common of the same bread and same meats. So the men all ate together. You couldn't eat on your own. And the food was disgusting. Their most famous dish was the black broth. They say that a certain king of Pontus, having heard much of this black broth of theirs, sent for a Lacedaemonian cook on purpose to make him some, but had no sooner tasted it than he found it extremely bad. So it is in the Perrin translation that we see these tables referred to as the common mess, where the boys ate. Because the boys had been divided into companies at the age of seven, these companies of 15 more or less... He arranged, and this is, this is Plutarch and this is the Dryden translation, he arranged each of them into their several bands and set over each of them for their captain the most temperate and boldest of those they called irons. This is the captain of their company. This young man was their captain when they fought and their master at home, using them for the offices of his house, sending the eldest of them to fetch wood and the weaker and less able to gather salads and herbs, and these they must either go without or steal, which they did by creeping into the gardens. So they were encouraged to steal. Plutarch continues, they stole all meat they could lay their hands on, looking out and watching all opportunities when people were asleep or more careless than usual. Now, none of this behavior prevents Plutarch from calling Sparta virtuous. He writes of Lycurgus, he filled Lacedaemon all through with proofs and examples of good conduct, with the constant sight of which from their youth up, the people would hardly fail to be gradually formed and advanced in virtue. So in overlooking this thievery, Plutarch has reminded me of some lines from Francois Rabeli regarding the unabashed thief known as Panergé, that friend of Pantagruel, regarding money he had tricks to come by it at his need, of which the most honorable and most ordinary was in manner of thieving, secret purloining, and filching, for he was a wicked, lewd rogue, a cousiner, drinker, royster, rover, and a very dissolute and debauched fellow if there were any in Paris. Otherwise, and in all matters else, the best and most virtuous man in the world. So now, much like our friend Panergé, who was afflicted with the disease that Horaboli calls lack of money, impecunitis, if we take the Leclerc translation, these Spartans were deliberately infected with this disease under the laws of Lycurgus. Plutarch writes, if they were caught, which is to say if they were caught stealing, they were not only punished with whipping, but hunger too, being reduced to their ordinary allowance, which was but very slender and so contrived on purpose that they might set about to help themselves. Plutarch continues, this was the principal design of their hard fare, as in the principal design of their small rations was that they become thieves. There was another, not inconsiderable, that they might grow taller. Okay, they were given very few rations so that they would grow taller. For the vital spirits, not being overburdened and oppressed by too great a quantity of nourishment due by their lightness, 
rise. Okay. All right. So this is this is Spartan thinking. The same thing seems also to conduce to beauty of shape. A dry and lean habit is a better subject for nature's configuration. So the men were always exercising and always observed by other people, it seems. And so take these lines. No one was allowed to live after his own fancy, but the city was a sort of camp in which every man had his share of provisions and business set out and looked upon himself not so much born to serve his own needs as the interest of his country. Therefore, if they were commanded nothing else, they went to see the boys perform their exercises. And indeed, one of the greatest and highest blessings like Hergus procured to his people was the abundance of leisure, which proceeded from his forbidding them to exercise of any mean or mechanical trade. So their life was hard, but taken from that angle Plutarch has just given us, it sounds like it had its perks. Their only concern was this military exercise, and the boys were always on display for their elders, quite creepily it sounds like. Regarding the physical beauty of the Greeks, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, that famous German philhellene and art historian, writes, The most beautiful body of ours, ours meaning those bodies to be found, in his own 18th century Europe, would perhaps be as much inferior to the most beautiful Greek one as Iphicles was to his brother Hercules. Winkelmann goes on to write, and this is from his essay on the imitation of the painting and sculpture of the Greeks, take a Spartan youth sprung from heroes, undistorted by swaddling clothes whose bed from his seventh year was the earth, familiar with wrestling and swimming from his infancy, and Winkelmann further still writes, the fair knew no anxiety about their attire. And there is one last thing to say about the art and their tombs, which are related topics. For the tomb is an opportunity for art. But first, Plutarch writes, Touching burials like Hergus made very wise regulations. For first of all, to cut off all superstition, he allowed them to bury their dead within the city and even round their temples to the end that their youth might become accustomed to such spectacles. And Michel... De Montaigne, the French writer of the 16th century, latches on to the wisdom of this and quite thoroughly commends it. He writes, We plant our cemeteries next to churches and in the most frequented parts of town in order, says Lycurgus, to accustom the common people, women and children, not to grow panicky at the sight of a dead man. And Montaigne goes on to write, There is nothing that I investigate so eagerly as the death of men. What words, what look, what bearing they maintained at that time. The Egyptians, after their feasts, had a large image of death shown to the guests by a man who called out to them, Drink and be merry, for when you are dead you will be like this. And Montaigne ultimately concludes, He who would teach men to die would teach them to live. All that being said, we now have to talk about the artwork that was on the tombs, which in the totally opposite vein does not emphasize the immediacy of short life, but the immortality of the dead spirit. Regarding these tombs, Plutarch writes this about Lycurgus. He commanded them to put nothing into the ground with them except, if they pleased, a few olive leaves. He would not suffer the names to be inscribed except only of men who fell in the wars. Now, the inspection of tombs is a valuable artistic quest for a visitor to the Hellenic world. And the reason is, as Percy Gardner writes, in his book, Sculptured Tombs of Hellas, no Greek custom constituted a larger part of religious cultus than did the offerings to the dead. And regarding Spartan sculptural relief, Percy Gardner writes this, Of these reliefs, the most important and the best preserved is now in the Museum of Berlin. It was found at Chrysapha, near Sparta. It is possible to gain some notion of the fashion of its carving, which is remarkable, and has been generally considered to indicate a hand or a school more versed in the carving of wood than in the sculpturing of marble. So looking at this actual piece that they found at Chrysapha, Gardner writes, A bearded man who faces outwards and who holds in his right hand a wine cup, and a woman who bears a pomegranate in her right hand, both figures are fully clad. Before their knees we see advancing two smaller figures, male and female, bringing as offerings a cock and an egg, a flower, and a fruit. Now this is Gardner assuming that that fourth thing is a fruit. So the first suppliant brings an egg and a rooster. 
the second supposedly a fruit and a flower. And I say supposedly because these objects could be any circular thing. So now it is time to take J.J. Backhoffen seriously because he interprets the significance of the egg in ancient art. Here is what he says about it. And once I read this, I, I'm going to explain what I think he means here. Okay, so this is J.J. Backhoffen. No symbol can be better calculated to raise the spirit above the limitations of corporeal existence to an intimation of one's own rebirth than the egg. It encompasses life and death. And he goes on the germ of all Tellurian organisms. Now, Tellurian just means of the earth. So in the egg, Backhoven continues, the initiate sees not only his own genesis, but also that of his god, the certainty that Tellurian birth can rise to the immortality of the higher luminous world. So now if that sounds esoteric, here's what I think he means in plain terms. If life can spring from the dead goop, of the egg into a chicken, so too then can our spirit or soul rise out of the dust of our dead bones. The God that has the power to do the one can do the other. And for this reason, interpreting the woman and what she brings, I don't think it's a fruit. I think it's a bulb. The bulb goes in the ground, just like you bury the dead, and out comes the plant. Seemingly, miraculously, new life. A similar demonstration of God's resuscitative power is presented in chapter 37 of the book of Ezekiel when we enter the valley of the dry bones that God gives flesh and sinews, reanimates, and causes to live again. Sparta, too, was meant to be given the gift of immortality through the death of Lycurgus, as Plutarch will narrate for us. Plutarch writes... Lycurgus, viewing with joy and satisfaction the greatness and beauty of his political structure, now, fairly, at work and in motion, conceived the thought to make it immortal, too. He called an extraordinary assembly of all the people and told them that he now thought everything reasonably well established, both for the happiness and the virtue of the state, but that there was one thing still behind, of the greatest importance, which he thought not fit to impart until he had consulted the oracle. In the meantime, his desire was that they would observe the laws without any the least alteration until his return. They all consented readily, and he set out for Delphi. And after he received an oracle that his laws were very good, he had it sent back to Sparta. But he himself did not return because of what he had said. And Plutarch writes, He made an end of himself by total abstinence from food, thinking it a statesman's duty to make his very death, if possible, an act of service to the state. 